Foundation is an unadaptable book series by Isaac Asimov. It's an unadaptable book by Isaac Asimov. That just so happens to be one of my favorite books and book series of all time. So when I heard that Apple TV Plus was going to be doing a TV show based on Foundation, I got a little concerned. And then they said a magic word that usually upsets book readers that got me really excited about this project. Don't worry, we're going to be changing things. And they did. They changed a lot. And those changes are what actually makes the TV show work. So let's talk about that today on this episode of Project Shadow. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast, or welcome to the first time, no whatever, whatever the case may be. My name is Charlie. I'm a non-binary sci-fi fantasy writer who's actually going to be working on a vampire romance novel next month, hopefully. Knock on wood, <laughs> everything stays the same. And today, I wanted to talk to you about the Foundation series over on Apple TV+. Plus. Now, don't worry. Don't worry. I'm not going to be getting into spoilers. Because I don't need to, to talk about some of the things that I want to talk about. And I had been debating when I wanted to do this, and I had it scheduled for today. But after my conversation about Dune last week, I feel that it's more important than ever to talk about Foundation and what they did right. Because... One of the things that's really been upsetting in a lot of the commentary that I've been getting back from my review of Dune, which, spoiler alert, I did not like, which you can see that review over on my YouTube channel, if you haven't already. It feels like everybody's already seen it, but it's fine. What I didn't like about that movie is I did not see them trying to retell the story in a way that fits the medium. And Foundation is a book, is a series, that is not visual in any way, shape, or form. It is a story about ideas. One idea in particular, and that is the predictability of human action. Psychohistory. Can we, with statistics and modeling, accurately predict the rise and fall of empires. Can we see the future? Can we truly prognosticate what will happen based on trends, based on the information that we have, and how far out can those predictions go? And how accurate are they? Are they prophecy? Are they set in stone? Are we so predictable that once we set our course and start moving towards it, we cannot change. These are the questions at the heart of the Foundation series. They're really about fatalism. How locked are we on the course of events that we're following? Can one person make a difference? Can a group make a difference? Or is everything that happens to us just blind fate that is completely outside of our control. And those are some really interesting questions, and they're really profound to explore in text. And Asimov does a really good job in exploring them, going through the concepts of the math and how the math works and how the story works and everything like that. It's really powerful to see how all this fits together. But... And it's a big one. The price that Asimov pays, like he does in many of his books, is that he doesn't care so much about the characters. He doesn't care so much about the little things in the story. Because everything that we're told in the story is in service of answering or asking that question. 
does life have the ability to change its course? Are we locked into our behavior? Can we change? Mm. That's a really hard question to ask, and that's a really hard question to answer, especially in film. So how exactly would you do that? So how would you adapt an unadaptable story? A story that's about ideas. A story that is so abstract that most of the characters exist only in service of exploring those ideas. You change the genre. You change the basic focus of the story. See, like I said before, Isaac Asimov, when he wrote Foundation, wrote it as an idea, as hero story. Psychohistory is the hero of the story. Chaos is the villain. And these are the actual heroes and villains that we follow throughout the course of the, the, the book. This TV show, on the other hand, realize that abstract concepts are not exactly interesting to watch. So it instead personified all of these ideas into characters. It created new characters. It changed existing characters. It focused in on characters that were, I don't want to say irrelevant to the story, but were not as present, that weren't as visceral, and decided to focus in on them and let them carry the weight of the story. You see, when we watch a movie or a TV show, we're there for the characters, we're there for the drama, we're there to experience this world through their eyes. And as such, we really want those characters to come alive for us. And as much as I love Isaac Asimov's writing, I can't say that any of his characters really did that, especially not in the Foundation books. A really good example of this is uh, Hardin in the books. I I, I couldn't stand him. I, I, I did not like his character at all. And I feel like the creators of the show felt the same way. And so they completely changed his character. And he has been gender swapped. He's been race swapped. And uh, Selva is a much more interesting character. The issues that Selva has to go through, has to cope with. How we focus more on Selva's family relationships and her relationship to the Foundation are central to the questions being asked. They're central to the mystery of the monolith, which they have really played on in a lot of ways in this series that really work. You see, now we're invested in Selva and her journey. We're interested in the characters. I never thought I could be interested in the council. The council in the books is uh, it, it's kind of kind of kind of dry. It's kind of Empire is uh, well, yeah, boring. I'm gonna say boring because they're designed to be that way. You see, the Empire is stasis. Remember when I said that the in the warring factions here are fate and fatalism and chaos, order and chaos. Well, if order and chaos are the two enemies, then empire is stasis. No, 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 things will not change. Things will always be the same. And as such in the book, oh, oh, oh my, they, they really are stasis. <laughs> they are constantly fighting for the status quo. Now, the difference that the show does is we actually get to meet the Cleons. We get to meet four of them. Only three of them are alive at any particular period of time. Brother Dawn, Brother Day, and Brother Dusk. We do get to see Brother Nocturne at one point, who is about to die just as Brother Day is being born. Which is how we meet four of them. And they give them personalities. They give them Oh, dare I say, characters? And so I'm invested in their story. But their story, no matter how personal it is, no matter how much we're seeing 
Brother Dusk struggle with completing his artwork and completing his life. Or Brother Day struggling, who will end up becoming Brother Dusk, struggling with keep maintaining order and controlling order. Or the first Brother Dawn that we meet, who will become Brother Day, trying to save the empire that he feels his elder brothers have squandered. Or the young Brother Dawn struggling with fitting in to this grand legacy that he has been born into. You see, all of these characters are still asking the questions of stasis, of how can we maintain and stay the same, but in a way that I'm invested into them, in a way that the book could never do. You see, the utter brilliance of the TV show in doing its adaptation was that, A, it thoroughly understood the text of the book. It understood what the story is actually about. All of the characters are the living embodiment of the themes that they basically manifested in the book. But because, well, watching a bunch of people discuss erudite topics in the most uh, fanciful and profound ways, which is a lot of what the book is, to be honest. It can be fascinating to read if that's your thing, but it, it doesn't make for the best television. And so getting to viscerally see the fights that take place on the Outer Rim, seeing this, the, the worlds get destroyed, meeting characters from those worlds and getting to really feel them. That connects you to the story. It invests you into the story. And this is how they just conquered this dense masterpiece of a classic. You see, understanding the story that's being told is so much more important than the details. Because what we really remember from a story yeah, we do focus in on some of the minutia. I'm not going to say that we don't. But what we really focus in on, what we really key in on, are those little things, those feelings, those sensations that we get. Whether they're senses of awe or wonder or fear or dread. Or just the thoughts that they make us have. Selva, as she is trying to understand her relationship to the monolith, her relationship to the Foundation, her relationship to her family and her lover, is a relatable character. She's a character that we all can identify with on some level. We've all been in an institution that just seemed like we really didn't belong here. <laughs> like maybe this is too grand for us, like maybe, I mean it's great that you believe so strongly in what this group is doing, but you know, I, I don't know if I do. We've all had those experiences, but keying them as the show does directly into the themes of the book where she knows she is the only hope the foundation has for survival. And if the Foundation dies, then a great dark age will take over and everything will fall apart. While she doesn't necessarily believe in the prophecies of psychohistory, as she always calls them, the plan, the plan. She doesn't know that she believes in the plan. She can see the conviction of everyone else around her and interprets her job as, well, I may not believe in this, but my real job is to keep them safe. So as long as I'm doing my job to keep them safe, I'm doing my part in the plan and everything will move forward as it needs to go because I cannot betray my friends and my family. Relatable. But isn't that just proving Harry right? I mean, isn't that just proving Harry Solden correct 
in all of his predictions in psychohistory that once the plan is set into motion, people will move heaven and earth to achieve it because they're not going to defy history. They're not going to defy the plan. They're not going to step out that the very forces that are moving the galaxy forward are so big that we just get swept up in them and that our individual choices don't matter. You see, by personalizing her story, we actually get to viscerally experience Selden's argument. And it becomes very hard to refute because while we have Selden having made the logical discussion very forward and straight, almost very straightforward and clear, we see it actively in her life. We see everything pushing her on, whether she wants it to or not. This is why it is more important to understand the, na the narrative than it is to copy the text. Because the Watchmen movie, for example, copied a lot of scenes from the comic verbatim. I mean, they're panel for panel what happened in the comic. The problem is the director behind that work thought that uh, Rorschach was the hero and thus made slight changes to the story to make that happen. See, he didn't understand the actual core of the book of the question that the book asks, who watches the Watchers? N none of the Watchmen were good people. None of them were heroes. And misunderstanding that basic thing? Ooh, that, that changed so much. And it made the movie really not work. It's actually what made the TV series that HBO did afterwards, the Watchmen series, work. Because they at least understood the original text enough to recreate it in a modern setting, retell it in a new way with new characters, for the most part, a few old characters come back, but in a way that felt meaningful and powerful, that showed the themes at work in a modern setting. That's magical. That's wonderful. And that's what Foundation was able to accomplish. You see, in understanding what the story was about, they could make sure that each of the characters did the things that they needed to do, but that gave them the freedom to, and I do not mean this as an insult, I've said this a few times to other people, and I think they think I'm insulting Isaac Asimov. I, I love Isaac Asimov's work, but making me fall in love with characters was not his strong suit <laughs> making me care about his characters was not something that he was good at because that was secondary to his goal of making me think about whatever the topic of the book was and in watching this show the way it's shot the grandeur through which they filmed the cleons and the grit and dirt that we see every time we go over to the foundation it's visceral. You feel it. The way the Cleons speak as if they are almost born of Shakespearean fibers. And the way everybody at the Foundation speaks, like real people just trying to struggle and muddle their way through. Yeah, I feel it. I feel it deep down in my bones. I feel it because they understood the story. Yes, the Cleons speak in a very stilted very clear language. And anytime they deviate from that, it feels wrong. And it should, because they're not meant to ever question their place in the council. They're not ever meant to question what Empire is doing. They're meant to always be right and to keep the reign of Cleon the First ever going. We're going to get rid of all chaos by only having one ruler and have him forever. Mm. And it's something that you can feel because movies, television, any visual medium is about feeling. Yes, we can have a very cerebral story. We can have a very cerebral storyline, 
But if we're not feeling it deep down in our bones, we're not going to care. And we have to care about these characters. And I do. I care about Harry. I can see the passion, which just feels very odd to me to say I see Harry's passion because he's such a cerebral character in the book to see him like having arguments and yelling. Just it was refreshing and helped me connect to him. Selva's journey, the Cleons. I, I keep going back to the Cleons. I never thought I would be so invested in these three clones <laughs> that really have no humanity left in them. Or do they? This story has asked a lot of questions about faith and religion and government and politics and war and organization and family and education. All of the things that are so important to us as a people, as a society, and as a culture. All of those things. And they're right there on the surface. Easy to grasp for anyone who wants to try. So what are we going to do here? How are we going to retell this story in a way that gives us life, that tells us what we're doing? Well, like we talked about before, we understand the medium. We understand what we're doing. If we don't understand how the medium we're working in tells a story, we're never going to be able to tell that story well. Comics tell a story one way. Books, another. Audiobooks are slightly different in the way that their narrative works, so they're a cousin to textbooks. But visual medium has to be felt. It's why pop the popularity grew as it became more visceral. See, silent films had a certain audience, but once you had sound, and once that sound design starts getting built and built and built upon, and the music takes us to places, and the soundscapes take us there, and the quality of the actors' voices. All of that keeps us there, keeps us invested. And of course, you also have to have a good cast, and it, it's very helpful that the people in who, ma who made Foundation have a very good cast. But beyond just understanding the medium and what the medium can do for you, if you're going to do adaptation, and I feel like I've said this maybe too much by now, but you have to understand the story. If you don't understand the story, then everything else is going to fall apart. You have to imagine that you're starting from scratch. And I think this is what they did really, really well with Foundation. The TV show seems to treat the book as kind of the myth the ideal. It's almost the platonic ideal that exists just, just, just over here. And all of the ideas are inflected through this modern sensibility. It would be odd if this entire move TV show, because I made a TV show rather than a movie, were nothing but uh, cis white men. <laughs> Which, for the most part, is what the book is. Because that's the audience it was written to, and I'm not going to defend or attack that. It is what it is. But it, it doesn't quite work on a modern stage. So we start adapting it. We start changing things. But the things that change don't affect the overall nature of the story. By making us feel something for the Cleons. It doesn't take away from them being the icons of stasis in this setting. Because especially Brother Dawn's story, I don't, I don't want to go into spoilers because I want this to be accessible to as many people as possible, but Brother Dawn, who is the youngest of the three Cleons, so Cleon the first, before he died, to maintain stability in the Empire and to prevent all of the struggles that were taking place over who sat on the throne, 
mandated that he would be cloned and there would be three of him alive at any period of time. So you have the young Brother Dawn, the ruling adult Brother Day, and the elder Brother Dusk. And that these three Cleons, the Brother Day being the one in the middle, would be responsible for both instructing Brother Dawn into taking his place in the greater empire as he grew up, but also learning from the wisdom of Brother Dusk and all that he had learned through his reign. Giving them stories where Brother Day really is struggling to feel that he fits into the grand scheme does not lessen anything. It drives home the point of who the Cleons are, what they are meant to be doing, and with what their function in the story is. You see, change can sometimes make things clearer when done properly. So what are my final thoughts on Foundation? It's brilliant. It's wonderful. It is one of the best sci-fi shows I have seen in a really long time. And maybe one of my favorite sci-fi shows of all time. And I, I've got some fairly high bars here. As far as storytelling, I would put it up there with Babylon 5 in that it has a very tight narrative. It knows what it's doing. It doesn't meander, which I felt like the book did from point time to time, where you could tell that Asimov got obsessed with a certain aspect of the theory of psychohistory and would kind of meander a bit. I, the show doesn't allow for that meandering. And that serves its purpose quite well. Um, I also like how they have changed certain things from the book. There, there's one scene in particular that I, I'm not going to spoil for anyone who has neither read the book nor watched the TV show. But I will say there's there's one particular event that takes place in the book that upset the hubby so much when I had him read it that he threw the book across the room and said that he's never going to finish reading the book. And I had to sit him down and explain to him, okay, that happens for a reason. That happens for a purpose. You, you will understand. It will make sense eventually. Just, just, just push through. Just push through. And the TV show handled this in a very different way. In fact, it's, it's probably the boldest change they made to the narrative. Yeah, it, it is definitely the boldest change that they made to the narrative because they basically cut that event out, kind of-ish, and substituted it with something different. And it is different. And my first initial reaction was, oh, that's not what happened. Because, you know, when you read the book, you know, you're, you're, you have that reaction. But as much as it again upset me for what I had seen in the story, it didn't cause me to have the, well, I'm not watching the show again, experience that the book did. Because it is a very upsetting thing in the book. And uh, I, I like the change. I feel that they made it work. And sometimes you gotta do that. Sometimes you gotta do that. I'm not gonna say that it's better than what Isaac Asimov came up with. But for the medium, it works better because it does feel a little, ooh, Asimov had an idea and is really driving it home. I'm really driving it home in the book. So <clears throat> it's fine. But yeah, not sticking doggedly to the book, but yet it has the same impact on the story as the event in the book. That's fine. That that can work. That can work out really, really well when you allow yourself to do that. And I, I'm happy that they did. I, I'm really enjoying all of it from, again, the way it looks, 
to the way it sounds. The sound design is brilliant. The acting is extremely good. And I never thought I would be emotionally invested in the series ever, just ever. So if you haven't checked it out, try to find a way to check it out. It's uh, the foundation series on Apple TV plus. It is probably the gold standard in sci-fi television right now for me in how it is wrestling with big, profound topics in a way that is accessible to a lot of people. And also just being a brilliant adaptation of an unadaptable work. So thank you so, so much for letting me go on and on and on about this for a goodly amount of time. If my name is Charlie Dorset, I write as CE Dorset. I have some stories over on Kindle Vella. If you're interested, check them out. I also do music as Project Shadow, which you can find in most places. So just search for me. You will find me. Uh, Into the Dreamscape is my latest single, though I have a new album that is almost ready to drop. Three more tracks. And as always, until next time, may you find the courage to go out there and do what you can to stop Asian hate, to remind the idiots who do not believe the Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter, the Black Trans Lives Matter, and the trans identities are magical. And until we talk again, may you have the courage to go out there and ride your dreams to reality. And don't forget to have the fun. Bye.